Welcome everyone, I'm Roel Welsing. Uh, this is my sixth year as Managing Director of Apahul. Warm welcome to you all. I'm not a native speaker, so I wrote down a couple of words to share with you this morning. First, on behalf of all the colleagues here, uh, we are, I, I just wanted to tell you we're tremendously proud to be the host of this first EASA Animal Welfare con uh, Conference. It's been quite a ride. It took us over three years to prepare for this conference. So this is probably one of the best prepared conferences ever in the history of EASA, <laughs> I assume. Uh, and, and I wanted to start off to give a big hand for all the people that organized this and had the patience for this whole uh, program to continue. So let's give a big hand for all these guys. So I, I, uh, I, I learned that you have a very full schedule today, tomorrow as well, the whole week, uh, I guess. Uh, so they told me you just have a couple of minutes to share any thoughts you have. Uh, this was quite a challenge, so I had to leave out a lot of stuff. And I thought, well, I maybe start with one slide. I have one slide for you guys, uh, which is the original business plan of the founder of Apenhul. This is this uh, I don't know if you all know the history of Apel. We started in 1971 with this vision of Mr. Wim Mager. He traveled in South America and saw this picture. He took this picture of children in, in the forest uh, being inspired or connected, or at least they had some sort of connection with these animals in the trees. And he thought, what would it... What, what great thing it would be if we could share this with people in the Netherlands, the children in the Netherlands. And he draw this picture, which is the, the original business plan of uh, Mr. Wim Mager and uh, the founder of this, this, uh, this beautiful park we're in, um, over 50 years ago. It was his vision and the, that of the other founding fathers in the early 70s to create a park from the perspective of animals. I don't know if you guys have been around in the park yet. Who has visited the park already? Okay, half of you guys. The other half will do so. <coughs> so they, des they designed the park from the perspective of animals. Our animals are free roaming. And the people visiting the park are guests in their surroundings. <laughs> So you've seen them free roaming or housed on islands and where we try to use uh, as many as natural boundaries as possible. We are guests in their worlds and this has led to a unique park with over 18 free roaming primate species and another 17 other primate uh, species on islands in a lush green environment. Everyone here in this room loves nature and we hope that a visit to our park increases the love of nature and animals in particular with our guests. We still think this was relevant in 1971, and it's probably even more relevant today that this happens, given the current situation of planet Earth. Given the fact that we house animals and take care of animals to fulfill our mission, we also want to be a front runner when it comes to animal welfare, especially with free roaming monkeys, you can imagine. It's very important we take a close look at how the animals are doing and behave. This, by the way, also has a very special, unique selling point side effect as well. You will encounter many zookeepers while walking through our park. And we all know how visitors feel about zookeepers. It's a magical kind of profession. <laughs> so the way we look at animals and their well-being is not static. It develops in time and it's becoming a more and more important topic also to the general public. I think zoos are experts on this matter and have a lot of expertise with regards to animal husbandry, their behavior and physical and psychological needs and well-being. So we also have this obligation to be a front runner. We all work with a lot of renowned institutes and universities to enhance our knowledge and that of others on this matter. This gives us the opportunity and, as I said, the obligation to be on the front, forefront in the discussion on animal welfare. <coughs> That's also why a conference like this is very important. We need to be a front runner, a reference point on this important topic. 
When I started at Apple, I asked Thomas, he's over there, our zoological manager, I don't know anything about animals, he does, why don't we ask our monkeys how they are doing? We ask our co-workers how they are doing. We ask our visitors how they are doing. Why don't we measure somehow what the animals think of Apehul and the way we treat them? Why shouldn't we try to make the discussion on welfare less intuitive and much more fact-based? Thus, we started to develop an animal welfare score together with the Dutch Association of Zoos. Uh, it helps us to develop our skills in animal keeping, and we look at it as a tool for continuous improvement. And I'm very proud we started that whole process. This animal welfare form, therefore, was also very important for us to, to, to get this, this discussion kicked off within the zoo uh, community. We see it as an impulse for a joint and continuous welfare program in zoos and other institutions. All this so we can work together to continuously improve animal welfare in as well as outside our parks. I wish you all a lot of inspiration and I hope you enjoy a visit to the park because that's what it's all about. Enjoy and learn. Have fun. Thank you. And I'll now, I'll now give the word to my fanwi. Super, thanks, Raul. So I am a native English speaker. I still need some notes as well. Also, even though I've lived here in the Netherlands for uh, 11 years now, I still do speak quite fast, especially when I get excited. And this is our first ever animal welfare forum, so I am super excited. I'm going to do my best to slow down. But what's really nice about seeing you all in person is if you start looking confused, I can slow down as well. That's a bit more difficult over Zoom when it's a screen full of people, but this way I have a better connection with you. But I'm delighted to see so many of you here today, and definitely I'd like to extend my thanks to Rule and the team here at Appenholm for all the great work they've done, as they said. A lot of preparation, a lot of, oh, it's not happening this year, it's going to happen next year, or maybe the year after, and then, oh, we can do it in March, oh, we can't, and we're here today. But I am so pleased that we are here today. Other thanks, of course, to all of you for um, still staying with us, staying connected with us through those times and being here today. And I'm sure we're going to have an excellent conference. And I'd also like to thank Kieserbrink, our main sponsors of this event. They've got a stand out in the foyer, so do pop and see them and find out all about how they can support animal welfare from a nutritional perspective as well. So as part of my presentation today, I just, you know, Sally's very keen that I keep to time. That's also difficult for me, along with slowing down when I get excited. But, um, as I said, it's nice to see so many people here, but also some familiar faces, but an awful lot of unfamiliar faces as well. And definitely from an IASA perspective, one of the things that's important for us is sharing best practice, not just within our community, but wider. And those of you that do know me know that I love my data. I love my numbers, because I do believe we need to make sound decisions based on sound science, on good data. I don't get to do a lot of animal welfare research, so my data is here on my piece of paper. Those of you that know me were already asking at the icebreaker, how many people are there here, Mavanwi? How many institutions? How many countries? So, looking around the room, I feel, or indeed I know, we've got 195 delegates. So this is amazing for our first ever forum from 127 institutions. Lovely to see that multiple, institution, or multiple institutions have sent multiple people. And also from 31 different countries, so a really diverse audience. And not all of those countries are just from Europe. We've got some overseas international visitors as well, so I'm delighted to welcome all of you. And then, if I take my maths a little bit further, 43% of people here at the conference are non-EASA members. And that's also really great, because we recognize that we want to share best practice and talk to other EASA members, but especially in such a rapidly evolving science like animal welfare, it's really important for us to talk to other stakeholders to get input from outside influences as well, and of course, share our expertise outside too. So to have such a high percentage of non-EASA members here as well is really great for me. I think those are some great stats and great bits of data that we can take forwards. The other thing I wanted to talk about a bit today was our new EASA vision. 
As of last year, we launched our new vision along with our strategic plan from 2021 to 2025. And again, those of you in the room that are YASA members, I've mentioned our vision in a number of different places, so hopefully you already have it front and center in your mind. But those of you that are new to IASA, our vision is really simple, really clear about who we are and where we want to go. We're progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. And for all of our parts of our vision, I really feel we have a strong theme of animal welfare throughout. If we want to be progressive zoos and aquariums, we need to be at the forefront of science. And that's animal welfare science, that's population management science, it's nutritional science, etc. But definitely progressive zoos have strong animal welfare. And as, exactly as Will was saying, we're able to ask the animals how they feel, how they're doing, and base that not just on intuition, but on sound science and data. The saving species, of course, is essential that we have good animal welfare in there. Making sure we're looking after the animals in our care in, from the ex situ perspective. Also thinking about our field work and our in situ work. If we're reintroducing animals, what are the welfare implications there? If we're managing field projects, again, what are the welfare implications of how we're managing those species in the wild? And under that saving species, that conservation element, we recognize there's a strong element of conservation education as well. And that's why, again, I'm really pleased to see so many people here, because this event is a great opportunity to educate ourselves about animal welfare and how that can improve saving species and conservation outcomes. And as I alluded to, the last part of our vision is the with you. Because actually, if we want to save species, we want to be progressive zoos and aquariums, we can't do that on our own. We need to do that talking to each other, as other IASA members, talking to other stakeholders, universities, NGOs, other experts in the field. And so the with you is a large part of encompassing our partnership work as well. So very much living our vision, progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you, has a strong animal welfare component throughout. And I'm really pleased that we're able to kind of live that animal welfare element through our mission statement and indeed our vision. Now, those of you that know IASA might know also in terms of how we carry out our work. We have an executive office. I'm super proud to have an amazing team of people around me. But also the office supports our IASA membership in doing a great deal of our work as well. And that work is broken down into committees and underneath those committees are working groups. And I wanted to say a little bit today um, on behalf of Holly Farmer, who can't be with us. She is the chair of our animal welfare working group. And so I just wanted to talk a bit about some of the activities they've been involved in. And also many of you will know Sally Binding, our animal welfare coordinator from the office, and the work she's been involved in as well. And a large part of that work has been about our animal welfare assessments. And I can see we've got some strong presentations and themes on these assessments throughout the program this week. And part of that work is sharing the animal welfare assessments that you've been involved in developing at your zoos. I had some interesting conversations with people at the icebreaker last night about single species welfare assessments, multiple species welfare assessments. And indeed, we're looking to share these assessments um, freely available on our main IASA website and also with more support and background in our member area as well. And with 31 different countries in the room, we recognize, much as I might like English to be our strong language, we need to have these assessments in multiple languages as well. And I'm really pleased that that's happening too. Of course, if there is an assessment out there that you like and it's not in your language and you would like to translate it for us and have it on our main website, we'd love to take advantage of that as well. So if that's happening, please come and speak to Sally and I'm sure she'll be more than willing to take on your translation services. So the welfare assessments is one piece of our work that we're doing. From IASA, we're constantly updating our standards and indeed our guidelines for members. And there's um, strong input from the welfare working group about those updates as well. So again, making sure we're being progressive, staying at the forefront of the work that we do. Now, weird as it might seem, some good things did come out of COVID, some heartache, but some good things. Because when we had to postpone the Animal Welfare Forum the first time in 2020, that gave us the opportunity to develop a series of animal welfare webinars. And I'm hoping that many of you in the room will have joined them online or perhaps seen them on the YouTube if you couldn't join in person. Those are still there on our IASA YouTube channel. And part of that work of doing these short webinars on different animal welfare topics will continue into the future. So we'll continue getting the message out that way. And our experience, dare I say expertise in some online learning, has also led us to develop our Slice of Science series. We're going to start with animal welfare topics. And these Slice of Science are a short um, uh, mini video tutorial 
from a researcher about a piece of their work, explaining it in a, an easy to understand way so that zookeepers can apply that to their work. And I'm delighted I'm scanning the room, but the light's quite bright, but we have uh, hopefully Katie Cronin is in the room here, who was our first researcher demonstrating that slice of science. And we're really looking forward to rolling out more of those as we go forwards. Again, those are available through our website or our IASA YouTube channel if you want to go and look at them and share them with your colleagues. The other aspect of sharing best practice are our courses. And this is definitely where Sally's taking a lead here. Um, Pre-COVID, a variety of in-person courses on animal welfare, advanced animal welfare, working with tutors from the community as well. And I know we had a very successful course yesterday as well, so hopefully many of you enjoyed that. But again, another benefit of COVID is being able to develop some of these elements in an online format. So we're also developing some online training in animal welfare assessments as well. So keep an eye out for that uh, opportunity to dip into learning, as well as some of the more in-person, face-to-face courses that will come throughout the rest of the year. In terms of other work, obviously, we have our conference here, but we do like to talk about animal welfare in other forums as well. So this is my opportunity to plug our main annual conference, taking place in September every year. Um, we do have animal welfare themes throughout that conference, so if you get a bit of animal welfare here and you want to get more, then you can come along to our annual conference. Our early bird rate closes in a couple of weeks, so get your registration in soon if you want to take advantage of that element. And then while I'm talking conferences, of course, I'm excited to be here, our first ever conference, but I'm also really positive that this will not be the one and only. We're looking to add the Animal Welfare Forum to our program of two yearly conferences on specialised topics. So I very much look forward to welcoming everybody in two years for our second Animal Welfare Forum at a location to be disclosed when we know what it is. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, two years in the future. I want to focus back here on now. I'm going to check my list to make sure that I mentioned all the things I needed to. And I'm really hoping I have. Quick look at Sally to check. Anything I missed out? All good? Fantastic. So, I'm going to focus back in here and now. I think we have amazing, exciting programs, some great speakers, and I couldn't be happier to welcome you all here to our first ever Animal Welfare Forum. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. So, with no further ado, I would like to welcome our plenary speakers for you this morning. Uh, starting up straight away with Dan Simmons, who is joining us from the Zoological Society of London. Thank you very much. Oh, this one. Yeah, Thank you. You can wave at the guys in the back corner. If Brilliant. You I'm completely operational, which will become evident. If For me in technology, if you can't fix it by hitting it with a hammer, I just don't trust it. So I'm hoping I get this right. So first of all, thank you very, very much to IASA for giving me, well, indeed, the great privilege to kicking off what I think is going to be a, a, an incredible few days of engaging talks, breakout groups, and, and hopefully snacks. The early start meant that I, I, I missed breakfast. Um, so... I'm here to talk about bridging the gap, and in this case, between theory and practice. But first, just a, a quick apology on behalf of, you'll notice on your, on your schedules that um, my colleague Nick Davis from Chester Zoo was going to be co-presenting with me. And the idea was we were going to sort of do a, a, a live um, academic versus non-academic myself, or a live practice um, versus theory, theory versus practice, and a live sort of bridging of that. Um, unfortunately, Nick's not able to attend last minute, but um, I've made some tweaks, but very much sticking to the same theme. So who am I? I'm Dan Simmons. My, my day job is Deputy Animal Operations Manager from, from London Zoo. Prior to that, I was a zookeeper for 17 years, predominantly looking after great apes, and we'll come on to the Great Eight Welfare Group in a second, and big cats and a bunch of other mammals. And it's, it's, it's brilliant to hear my former career as being a magician. I was indeed a magician in the eyes of my zoological directors who would give me no budget <laughs> to create exhibits from nothing. That is magic. Um, and now I hold the budget a bit, and obviously I expect that same magic from my keepers as we move forward. Um, so I'll be talking about that important gap between theory and practice, but also, I suppose, ultimately, can you still hear me? Yep, sorry. Um, 
ultimately, one of the key reasons I'm here is because my involvement as interim chair of the Grade 8 Welfare Group, and I'll talk about the Grade 8 Welfare Group as we go through. So first question, is there a gap? Well, yes, of, of course there's a gap. It, that's, what, that's why there's theory, and that's why there's practice, and that's why there are practitioners, and that's why there are people that think. Um, where I work, we're often classed as thinkers versus doers. I'm very much classed as one of the doers. But we're also really good, in brackets, bad, at kind of going into our silos, and the thinkers stay in their boxes, and the doers stay in their boxes, and we're deemed to be really good at what we do, but do we indeed look at that bridge, and do we walk across that bridge in both ways on a regular basis? Frankly, no. But then equally, there's so many things that we do do that perhaps without realising we are bridging that important gap. So I suppose first question is, does the gap need fixing? Well, well no, because like I say, I think, certainly in my opinion, the gap is quite normal, it's quite healthy, um, it's there for a reason. Um, I've worked with zookeepers that are PhDs. Um, I've worked with researchers that want to be zookeepers. Um, gaps are already forming, uh, or rather not forming, are, are being merged together. Um, so does it need fixing? No. But does it need collaboration? Absolutely. So that metaphorical bridge that I'll keep talking about that we need to cross in both directions is something that we do do. We do it well, but like I say, we also do it really badly at other times. And so looking at how we can bring the two sets of minds together um, is really important. And so Gorg, as I mentioned here, the Grade 8 Welfare Group, um, needed to look at um, a, a solution for um, bridging... Uh, that gap and I'll explain first why by the way this photo I had a great opportunity nearly 10 years ago I can't quite believe it of, of spending about a week here um, as a gorilla keeper coming to do effectively some some CPD some some continued professional development as a, as a zookeeper and working at um, a world renowned primate facility and it was a great opportunity I actually stayed in what I believe was the zoo flat in brackets a sort of a room directly above the gorilla back dens, peak summer, and, and, and believe me, the juvenile gorillas do wake up at about five o'clock in the morning here, and their kind of key hobby was to bang boomer balls on the wall for hours and hours every single day that I was here. But it was a fantastic opportunity, and what a stunning um, institution this is when you walk through the doors. Um, so why was Gorg founded? Well, ultimately, going back quite a few years now, um, the government department in the UK, called DEFRA, um, responsible for our Secretary of State standards for modern zoo practice. So for all our overseas visitors, just to, I suppose, put that into a nutshell, the document that a zoo inspector will effectively use when inspecting a zoo and upholding or maintaining a license for a zoo, the zoo's got to adhere to that. So there's an existing document in place. But DEFRA wanted to upgrade that document. That document, which I'll talk about in a second, is out for consultation. It's a massive document, 174 pages, and a lot of work needed to go into it. In its existing form, there was no mention of great apes, and a lot of work had gone into elephants as a special appendix in the UK. And the plan was to add an appendix for great apes. So DEFRA got in contact with the director of biosciences, at Birmingham University, who was the chair of the Grade 8 group and, and currently isn't just um, for a, a bit of a break and I'm, I'm, I'm stepping in as interim, and approached him to say, look, do you think you could help us with this appendix? It's obviously very specialist, but we want to be sure that we've got the thinkers and the doers brought together so that we're creating a document that isn't just purely academic, and it's not something that's made just by a bunch of zookeepers. That would be a disaster. I can, I can say these things about zookeepers. I was a zookeeper. Um, so bringing them together, bridging that gap, and forming a document that would effectively be an appendix and a part of a legal document in the UK. So Birmingham University got to work. And many years ago now, it doesn't seem that long back in March 2018, established a Great Ape Stakeholder Workshop. Um, I put in that it was, it was facilitated by a professional facilitator. Again, zookeeper joke. You put a bunch of zookeepers in a room, good luck getting anything done. But equally, maybe the same for the academics. Lots of opinions, lots of subjectivity. So the professional facilitator really helped. And we had 36 attendees from all stakeholder groups. Confidentiality agreement was really important. 
Um, we had groups there that I suppose one could deem arguably perhaps not so favourable towards zoos, which was equally really important to make sure we got all opinions involved. And the outcome was, after a really intense day, 14 founder members of the Great Hope Welfare Group, of which uh, I was one and, and, and still am. Um, so, as well as the Secretary of State's document, that I'll come on to in a second, we then had one other sort of remit, which was to look at the keepers, the keepers of the great apes in the UK, what could we do for them? And up until that point, there was no really official um, continued professional development other than the sort of ad hoc things that I mentioned, which was very much done zoo by zoo. But we wanted to do that on a national basis, and so we did. And we've done three of them since at three different zoos in the UK, 170 attendees and 35 collections. And looking at a bunch of topics, all of which, again, look at bridging that gap between the theory and the practice. And lots of the speakers were academics. Lots of the speakers were practitioners. And it worked really well. Um, and we'll certainly be doing more of them. And some of the things we looked at were here. But I'll pick out the obvious one, which is welfare audits. I'm lucky enough to be joined here, and I'm sure if you don't yet know Lisa Clifford, who's there, you will know her soon. Um, I've had the real benefit of um, working with Lisa on, on welfare audits, as we call them. That's right, isn't it, Lisa? Yeah. We call them audits in London, not assessment, the same thing. Um, and I think a really good example of how we bring those two elements of thinking versus doing together. And obviously, that starting point, as I learned when I did my very first one as a keeper, the amount that one can learn about what an animal experiences in the wild versus what we do in practice in a zoo, and often looking at that massive gap. Also being really proud of the bits that we do that are right there and we're getting it right, but then critically the objectivity of it, so removing the subjectivity of it, which keepers, again, great at subjectivity, but the assessments or the audits really allowed us to, to change that. And then we looked at a bunch of other things, all of which is so fundamentally important to the practice side but in order for the practice to happen we need the research we need the science and as long as that's communicated in the in the appropriate way in the right way to the zookeepers that put it into practice then it's really good and it works so one of the things there was body condition scoring for example and these big hairy feet sorry there's a real bias here for photos as you'll see that's mostly what i've got um, Big hairy feeds are a silverback gorilla, and these are scales. So one of the things, for example, we spoke about was the theory of body condition scoring. So there's lots of research. You can look up a bunch of stuff about it. But then the problem is it does get, to a degree, fairly subjective, because if you're looking at a scale of, let's say, one to nine, what one person says is a four, another person might say is a five, for example, and it's really hard to know. So si simple things were we looked at, well, Let's, let's make it a bit more objective. Let's add in weight. So let's make the weight complement the, the condition score, which is really simple. But again, there are challenges with the practice of that because, you know, you install scales for gorillas. This gorilla, the first thing he tried to do was rip this off the floor and break it. And the same would be for orangs or for chimps. It's, it's, it's a real challenge. But it's something that we were able to discuss and people went away with those solutions thinking, right, let's try and let's try and up our game when it comes to BCS and what else can we do? Can we go to our zoo collections and say, or to our directors and say, please, can we have some scales? And there's a real value to it, backed up by the science that the body condition scoring um, gives us available. So this is a video which I'll play perhaps first and then talk about why I'm playing it. Yes. Um. Go. Arm. Pick up. One more. Arm. Good go. One more. Again. Arm. Good girl. There you go. Sorry, I meant to edit that last annoying bit of what that is me, a voice at the end, but yeah. Um, 
So w w what is this? What am I doing? You, I, I'm sorry, it's not a great video, but what, what I'm doing there and was listed in the previous slide was the operating condition and the training and, and the importance of that. So what I'm actually doing, you can't really see in my hand, but it's a syringe. It's a blunt. It's a real syringe. It's a blunted end. And I'm conditioning. You can see we start them young at London Zoo. This is a really, really young gorilla who's now fully hand injection trained. And this was actually her very, very first session. And it's really basic. You can see she puts her arm out and I take that opportunity to capture the moment poke her in the arm and then progress up to, excuse me, progress up to uh, injecting them if needed. She's never actually had an anaesthetic, fortunately, which is great, um, in the arm. So, so why do we do that? Well, I suppose a starting point I always like to think about when, when we discuss training and the practice of training great apes is, well, um, put it this way, um, well, I think we're all very used to injections in the last couple of years, but you go to your GP for a flu jab and the GP gives you two choices. They say, look, you can sit down calmly. We'll talk this through, and I'm just going to lift up your shirt. You'll feel a little scratch, and I'm just going to give you the injection. All good. Or does the GP get a rifle out and chase you around the GP surgery? As you're terrified, he shoots once, misses, has to reload. Whilst you're there, terrified. No, of course not. And it, it's kind of funny to say it that way, but the reality is that's what the animals experience. Um, so... Believe it or not, well, if we have new electrics installed in an enclosure, as a zookeeper, I'd always go and touch it. That sounds stupid, but actually I figure, hang on a sec, if the animals have got to touch it, and only, probably only once they'll ever touch it and then stay away from it, well, why shouldn't I have to touch it? So I touch it. Um, I asked the vets if they would dart me. Seriously, obviously they wouldn't. Um, but I guarantee that it also really hurts. If anyone that hasn't actually seen a dart that comes out of a gun, it's not like the syringe that you get in your GP surgery. It's a whacking great needle, it's got to be, because it's got to withstand the impact. So not only is there a degree of fear and anticipation, but it also hurts. So that's why we train the animals. Um, it can be slightly divisive, and I fully respect institutions that decide not to do it. I'm sure they've got all their reasons. At London, we, we choose to do that. So what we'll do is spend every single day a brief bit of time with this hand injection training. And once they're fully trained, um, the gorillas in actually at London will, will opportunistically, they will often just do this thinking, any chance I could have a reward? Any chance? Um, and that's how positive we've been able to turn injections into for them. And then it means that on the day, the very rare day, like I say, this animal's now seven years old. She's never had an anaesthetic. I hope she never needs one. But if we do need to do one, she thinks it's a training session. It's all super positive. She sees that best thing in the world. It's a syringe. I'm going to get some treats. She gives her shoulder. And then the next thing she knows, she's waking up from a completely stress-free um, procedure. So really, really important. Um, and then the next one. Oh, sorry. Chest. 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 So lots of science, lots and lots of science and theory behind this. So, what are we doing? So this is acetation. This is checking using a probe. This is a fake probe. I'll explain why in a second. Um, on, a, on a male gorilla, so lots of cardiac problems in both wild and, and, and zoo collection gorillas. Um, so we've got the science there. We know there's a, an issue. So what can we do? How can we proactively um, try and intervene? So this is some training um, to condition a gorilla to uh, a cardiologist coming in and doing exactly the same. Again, I'm afraid that's me, um, but doing exactly the same. But the reason I wanted to show this video is, as practitioners, we also have a gap there between, if you like, almost theory and practice that we get wrong. So this is a good case of getting it wrong. It looks, you know, that looks like the animal's really conditioned. What you don't see are all the videos where he grabs the probe, pulls it through, and he used to lasso it around his head and bite it and what have you. These things cost a fortune. The unit themselves are relatively inexpensive, but the heads are really, the probes are super expensive. So we had to guarantee to a cardiologist that there was absolutely no way the animal would grab it and he needed to be completely conditioned for that. So we would do this training for 
a couple of years, but we never put it into practice. So was that a bad thing? No, because we always hoped we eventually could. But often when it comes to animal training, sometimes in the rare cases, we ask that question, well, okay, that's great, but um, for example, you're training the animal to hold its mouth open and you let, you, you let it put a torch close to its mouth. And have you ever actually asked a dentist to come in and look at that animal's, animal's mouth? Or are you just doing that every single day without reason? So having that theory, but putting it into practice for zookeepers is incredibly important. Otherwise, you're just kind of doing training for no reason. And this... This ended up having no reason because it never went anywhere. And obviously, we went into it fully intentional for it to have a reason. But at a certain point, it's important to call it and say, why am I actually doing this? Why am I using this theory but not turning it into to true practice? Um, so um, before I move on to the bit I spoke about at the beginning about the Secretary of State standards, um, I wanted to talk about what we did a little bit in advance. So this isn't my work at all. This is Dr. Johanna Neufus, uh, linked to Birmingham University. What DEFRA, the, 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 the UK government organisation, uh, the agency wanted to be sure of is when they um, put out the new um, zoo standards for consultation, that those standards weren't going to basically put anybody out of business. They had to be realistic. Um, and whilst the Great Ape Appendix is really relevant, it's really specific, it's used those thinkers and the doers, we had to make sure that it could also be implemented. So we conducted a facility and management survey. Um, as you can see here, 16 facilities in the UK. And then picking up a few things. So for example, this is, I think, a really interesting one. 90%, and this is for all four of the Great Apes, didn't provide UV indoors for, for great tape. So a really, really good example, again, of theory versus practice. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Frances Bain, seen her incredible talks. I've seen it three times. I think it's brilliant, brilliant for zookeepers, brilliant for everybody to learn about UV, and so much more to learn. And we're really good at talking about it in, in zoos and how important it is and, and how we've always got to focus on it. But then when you actually look at the nitty-gritty of it, and say, well, okay, great, how many of you have actually got a UV unit above some of your mammal species, not sort of reptiles I think we're relatively good at? Um, the answer is often no, but then even worse, and a real bugbear of mine is, yeah, we, we do UV, we, look, we've got UV there. When was the last time you tested the UV lamps? Do you know what that's emitting at different levels? Do the animals actually bask under it? So it's just a tick box sometimes, which is no one's failing. I like to feel that in five years' time, I think we'll be so much more advanced with UV. Vitamin D3, I think, is the new vitamin C, certainly is in the UK. We're always told about vitamin C. I swear blind by taking vitamin D3 all through the winter and the importance of it. And we understand and appreciate the challenges that it's not so easy for a vet just to say, yep, you know, let's give the orangutans some D3 when they don't actually know, because we don't yet know really what is the baseline. So, so much more opportunity for those researchers to feed in to the practitioners so that we can hopefully at one point either provide that UV through prophylactically through uh, oral um, vitamins or supplements uh, or indeed through the natural UV itself. And then we went through a bunch of other things which you can see there, some good, some bad. The off-show elements, that element of practice which is um, off-show during the day, I should say. So again, can be slightly divisive between zoos, and I completely understand that, especially in my new role. I used to be a zookeeper. Now in my current role, I'm much more visitor-focused. I'll look at the welfare and perhaps more of the staff than the animals. Um, so I need to, when I consider the visitor needs, for example, to my zoo, I need to consider, well, if you've just paid to come in and you go to Gorilla Kingdom, our great ape exhibit, um, you expect fairly understandably, to see gorillas. But equally, we need to make sure that we're managing the welfare of our animals 24 hours a day, including during opening time. So we indeed give our animals the ability to be completely off show during opening times. But that can also mean you come to see gorillas and don't see gorillas. And that's often just then a communication piece for zoos to understand, well, if you explain that correctly to the visitors, they'll, they'll accept it. And as long as you give them an opportunity to hopefully come back during that same visit to see the animals. 
um, and give them some tips as to good times where the animals might be on show, then it's really important. But equally, it was a really good discussion point and something that has been spoken about in the new standards for everyone to have a think about how they manage their great apes. Do they indeed give them that option to be completely off show, have those downtimes at their choice during zoo opening times? So this is it. It's a, it's a pretty boring document, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's 174 pages in the UK. Um, like I say, out for a 12-week consultation period, and we're, we're pretty much at the end of that. Um, but, but critically, I spoke about that collaboration at the beginning and how the Great Eight Welfare Group was formed. And we indeed did work really well with Biaza and with DEFRA to collaborate and work together with the thinkers, with the doers, the academics, the operators, to make sure that we produced a document to go out to consultation that, that would work, effectively a best practice guideline, but critically, and this is really the most critical thing, what changed from the, the, the existing document to the, the, the latest document is that the word should, and it just sounds like, well, it's just a word, the word should has changed to must. So the document is now really serious. So bearing in mind this is effectively going to be a legal document that says you must do the following. So this is really going to be quite a game changer for the way we consider how we manage great tapes in the United Kingdom. Um, like I say, we don't want to put musts in there. DEFRA don't want to put musts in there. They're going to put people out of business. But it's going to really make people think about it. It's going to force people to think about how... They manage their great apes, and we've used all of that research, all of that theory to match up with the practice. Um, took quite a few years to write, millions and millions of, of, of versions, um, and like I say, bringing together industry, academics, government experts, uh, all working um, together. Um, so we looked at five key areas. Um, environment, so I spoke, for example, about UV, but another really simple one, humidity. How many zookeepers can say straight away what is the typical humidity in Central Africa for a bunch of uh, uh, great apes or for orangutans? Um, most of them probably will know, but equally, when challenged through the welfare audits, welfare assessments, it really makes them think so much more. So bringing those two elements together, the research and the reality, is, well, okay, if we're not meeting those parameters, then what do we need to do? And things like humidity pretty simple, just put in a mister or just increase your humidity, uh, dampen down your substrate, but just gets people thinking rather than doing the same thing over and over. How do we design our enclosures? Uh, do they replicate wild habitats? Well, certainly you come to someone like Appenhall, absolutely, what a, what a lovely place to sit, but one of my, to, to visit, but one of my challenges at London Zoo, we're in the middle of London, it's, it's, it's difficult, but we still have to try. Um, feeding nutrition is so important, and a critical one that has now come into light, and certainly after most people remember the Harambe incident from a few years ago, public safety, you go to a zoo, um, and again, the assumption is just as if you go to a roller coaster park, when you're strapped in, you don't ask the question, sorry, is, is this safe? You kind of just assume that it's been done. So that important responsibility for zoos to remember that, of course, the visitors aren't going to come in thinking, well, um, is this place safe? They're going to assume that we've done all that. So don't let the visitors get near the animals, um, unless they're walkthroughs, <laughs> obviously. Uh, squirrel monkeys. I think you do worse than we do. Oh, my God, squirrel monkeys. Um, so if anyone doesn't know the in-joke, don't. Oh, my God, squirrel monkeys. They bite a lot. And if you work in operations like I do and you have to deal with the, the visitors a lot, believe me, squirrel monkeys, it's a, it's a nightmare for me. Um, and then critically... And I suppose really now to, to finish up my talk, um, looking um, for great apes at long-term management planning, but indeed for all species. So appreciating the importance of we've got that research there, we've got that important science, we understand the welfare needs, but what can we do to write it down and make sure that it's part of a long-term management plan for all of the species that we have in zoos to take that responsibility and understand that what we are at the moment right now is ultimately just stewards of our collections. There are people that are going to take over. There are animals that are going to outlive us in some cases and to take real responsibility for those animals and indeed for their welfare. And hopefully that's something that will be spoken about at great depth in the next few days. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. That was a really inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you. So I'm going to move straight on now to our next opening plenary speaker. This is uh, Professor Xavier Manteca Villanova from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, good morning, everyone. Before I get started, I would like to thank the organizing committee of this conference for inviting me to be here. Thank you very much to the uh, local organizers for putting this uh, venue uh, together for us and, and on all the organization. And also, I would like to um, thank my colleagues who appear as uh, co-authors here and like to draw your attention to the fact that they come from four different countries. That's uh, Belgium, Denmark, the United Kingdom, and Spain. And also, they come, or we come, from uh, both the academia and the zoo community. And this collaboration between countries and between different stakeholders is going to be an underlying theme of my presentation, as with the uh, previous speaker as well. Now, uh, this is the plan of my talk for the next 20 minutes or so. It's, it's very simple. Uh, I like to start by uh, exploring uh, also the, the gap we have between what we need, ideally, to assess welfare uh, based on science and what we have now. And then I like to suggest uh, a possible bridge of that gap. And, uh, and please uh, be aware that uh, it's just a suggestion. Uh, there are many other ways of bridging the gap. So I think we all will, will agree with the gap. As for the bridge, we'll have different approaches, and that's, that's fine. And then I will finish with a summary and some uh, take-home messages. OK, so let's start then with the gap. Now, I think we, we all agree with this. Uh, we, uh, we are aware that we need uh, welfare assessment tools basically to identify problems and also to monitor progress when we design and implement improvement strategies. And probably we all agree as well in that uh, that welfare tool or those welfare tools have to be based on science not on subjective opinion, they have to be realistic, and they have to cover a, a wide range of species. Now, if that is the, the thing we need, then the question is, what does it take to have a welfare assessment protocol which is based on science? And I think that to, to answer that question, it might be useful to forget for a second zoo animals and look back to farm animals. And that is uh, because we have been looking at the welfare assessment uh, farm animals for much longer, and they are somehow easier because to start with, there are five, six, seven, eight, ten species, not thousands of species. And then when we want to design studies, we have hundreds of pigs or chickens or cows, not perhaps 10 or 20 individuals of a given species. So they offer us the opportunity to work in an area which is far easier. And we have developed assessment protocols for farm animals, among many others, the welfare quality, which covers cattle, pigs, and chickens, and the AWIN protocols. Of course, they do have problems, but I think it is fair to say that, by and large, they are based on scientific evidence, and they, they work. Now, uh, if we look at those, at those protocols, the welfare quality and the AWIN protocol, we can sort of disentangle what, what are the bricks that make up a welfare assessment protocol. So what we need to have those protocols based on science. Now first, and, and that is the fundamental part to me, we need indicators. And we don't need one, we need very many. Why? Because animal welfare, regardless of the definition, includes different aspects or domains, and there is no single indicator that can cover all of them. So we need many indicators, and we need indicators which are valid, 
feasible, and reliable. That takes a lot of work, but it's far from being enough. Why? Well, because when we have, say, one indicator to start with, we need to have a methodology which has to be validated as well. So it is not just a matter of having the indicator for one species. We need the indicator plus the methodology to measure that indicator. And you may say, well, that's very straightforward. You go and measure. Well, that's not the case because, as you all know, science tells us that whenever possible, we have to rely on animal-based indicators because they provide a more reliable information on the welfare of the animals, very often, than resource-based indicators. And animal-based indicators require a methodology that may be difficult. Body condition scores, clinical signs, behavioral changes, it is not always obvious how to measure that. So repetitive behavior may be valid, but for how long do you have to observe the animal? In the morning, in the afternoon, every day, every other day, once a week, all that has to be validated as well. Then we need a scoring system for each indicator. And finally, we would need an aggregation system so that an overall score of welfare can be obtained. Now, we could compromise a little bit on this and say that perhaps we don't need the aggregation system if we don't want a final score or label, which is fine. If we want the, scoring, uh, the, the assessment tool to identify problems, and to improve the situation of the animals, the final score may not be needed. So we may improve, we can improve the health of the animals, and we have been doing that for many years, without having an overall score of health. That's fine, but still, we need all the rest. A list of valid indicators, a methodology that has been validated as well, and an scoring system. That is what we need according to science. Now, what do we have? Well, sadly, we have some good stuff, but not a lot. For example, this sea well protocol for dolphins, which uh, I am sure you all know, was probably, if not the first one, one of the first ones to, uh, to build on the experience with farm animals to develop a protocol for zoo animals. And, and it's, it's an excellent, an excellent tool based on the uh, welfare quality approach. So four principles or domains of welfare with different indicators. So that's, that's good, we have this. More recently, uh, Dr. Salas, now in Belgium, developed a similar protocol for Dorcas gazelles. And more recently, uh, a couple of uh, British scientists developed, also based on welfare quality, a protocol for ducks and geese. And uh, all of them based on the welfare quality approach. And we have some other very interesting things as well. For example, this behavioral welfare assessment tool for uh, captive elephants developed by uh, British colleagues as well. But if you think about it, well, we have uh, dolphins, Dorcas gazelles, elephants, some bird species, some other things, but at the end of the day, that might be how many? 20, 25, 30, 50 species. We have a welfare assessment tool, and yet we deal with thousands of species in our zoos. Now, you could say, okay, well, you're, going, you're being very pessimistic because we do have some other things. For example, we have the five domain approach by Mellor. And that's excellent, so don't take me wrongly. That five domain approach is an excellent framework. I am all for it. But it is not a welfare assessment protocol. It's just a model, a framework, on which we can build different assessment protocols. And then at the IASA Animal Welfare Assessment Library, we do have several uh, tools which we may call perhaps generic tools because basically they are checklists, uh, lists of questions that 
would guide us when we try to assess the welfare of different animals. But yet, even though they are extremely useful, they are not welfare assessment protocols. They are not a list of valid indicators with a valid methodology. So the uh, end of the story is that for the vast majority of species, and when I say the vast majority, I mean the vast, vast, vast majority, we do not have any welfare assessment protocol. And even for the ones that we do have an assessment protocol, we still need, at least in some cases, some work to validate either the indicators or the methodology to measure the indicators. So the gap is there, the gap is huge. Now, what do we do then? If you are lucky enough and you have to work with uh, elephants or dolphins or Dorcas gazelles or some other <coughs> of the luckiest species, go and get the protocol. But what if you are having to work with warthogs or armadillos or small claw otters or whatever? What do you do then? Well, I think we can tackle this question in two different ways, and this is the second, the second part of my talk. Now, one possibility, which if you want would be the most straightforward, would be to say something like, okay, I need something which is based on indicators. I don't have the list of indicators. I go and get them. And perhaps if I do a thorough review of the scientific literature, I will find the indicators. Now, this has been the approach of uh, Cecile Scofflund. Cecile is a PhD student at Copenhagen uh, University. She is doing her PhD on uh, welfare assessment of polar bears. And as part of her PhD, the first thing she did was to carry out a very comprehensive lead review on welfare indicators for polar bears. So that's a very good approach. We want to develop the, the assessment tool. We start with the indicators, which are the bricks of the wall. Now, this is the result. Now, uh, she has found evidence of validity for one indicator, which is abnormal behavior, so basically repetitive behavior. Now, it is true that Cecily has found other promising behavioral indicators, such as activity, inactivity, social behavior, play, and many others. But if you look at the third bullet point, just be aware that uh, she says in the paper that all these other behavioral indicators were run further research. So as for really valid indicators, we have one in the literature. You can read about this in the uh, paper that she has published in Animal Welfare. So if you Google Scofflun, polar bears, animal welfare, you will get the, the paper, which is a very, a very good one. But just be aware that uh, these are polar bears. It is a very charismatic species. We know that it might be difficult to, to have them in good conditions in captivity. And yet, after a very comprehensive review, months of work, she has found one valid indicator. So imagine if you are interested in one species which is not that charismatic. And this happened to us uh, recently. We uh, have been asked by several zoos in, in Spain and other countries to get involved in the welfare assessment programs. And we had to work with a zoo in, in Spain, a very nice one, that has uh, eight mammalian species in, uh, in the zoo, eight one. So uh, before getting there, I did uh, a quick review of possible indicators for those eight species in the scientific literature, in the animal welfare scientific literature, and I didn't find a single one for any of the eight species. Not charismatic mammals, just small, medium-sized mammals. No single indicator validated for any of those species. So what we can do then if we don't have the protocol and our species is not as charismatic as the polar bear, and we have literally nothing in the, in the science-based literature. Well, uh, 
I suggest we can follow them on a slightly different approach, which is the one we are following now with uh, Komodo, Komodo dragons. And this started again with a zoo in, in Spain, the, uh, the zoo in Barcelona, that asked our uh, animal welfare group at the vet school uh, to get involved in the uh, welfare audit of several species. The zoo and the Komodo dragon was one priority species. So uh, originally, it was uh, Barcelona Zoo and the vet school in Barcelona. And then we uh, liaised with uh, the Chester Zoo in the UK and the IASA working group on Komodo dragons to have something more meaningful and built on, on that collaboration I was advocating for, as, as, as with uh, Daniel uh, before. Now, uh, what is the approach we are suggesting now for the Komodo dragon? Because as you, as you can imagine, for the Komodo dragons, we have no indicator that has been validated in the literature. So you can spend months looking at animal welfare journals for indicators for Komodo dragons, there is nothing. So our approach is to uh, change it a little bit, how we look at this, and build on uh, three sources of information. One is the experience of veterinarians, curators, and keepers. The second one is science, but not animal welfare science, from at least from a traditional perspective. But if you want to use a more classical work, natural history, if you want to use a more modern, fancy word, behavioral ecology of the species we are interested in, in this case, Komodo dragons. And then we want to use as well basic comparative animal welfare research. And by this, I mean good scientific data on animal welfare that doesn't refer specifically to Komodo dragons, but we think can be applied to a variety of taxa. And I'm going to explain what I mean for that uh, later on. Now, what we ask as of veterinarians, curators, and keepers. Well, basically, main welfare problems of Komodo dragons, according to their experience, which are related mainly to health and husbandry of the dragons. And what they uh, have told us is that basically there are four issues that they believe uh, should be included in any welfare assessment tool for Komodo dragons, which are temperature, light issues, obesity, and lack of medical training. Now, some of these will not appear in animal welfare journals, but still the evidence for this is scattered in uh, veterinary medicine journals, proceedings of veterinary congresses, and so on. So it is scientific evidence. It is not the scientific evidence you would find in animal welfare journals, but still it is scientific evidence. So that's one source of information. The other one is natural history, behavioral ecology. We do have very, uh, two very good books on the behavioral ecology of Komodo dragons, uh, people who spend months, years working with Komodo dragons in Indonesia, and they gather uh, information on climatic conditions in uh, their natural habitat, natural diet, and behavior of the Komodo dragons in the wild. Again, if you uh, put in, in Google uh, animal welfare and Komodo dragons, many of these uh, works will not appear because it is scientific information, but it is not the scientific information in our field of expertise, if you want, which is animal welfare. But yet, it is science. And then, we look at basic comparative animal welfare research. And why is that? Well, because if you remember what I said about natural history and behavioral ecology, one thing we are very interested in is the natural behavior of the Komodo dragons in the wild. So what we want to do then, when we know that, is sort of look at that natural behavior in the light of basic animal welfare science to try to understand whether a given category of natural behavior is important for welfare. 
So if the evidence across taxa, for example, tells us, and it does, that normal foraging behavior is important for the welfare of a wide variety of animals, we will assume that normal foraging behavior is important for Komodo dragons. And since we know what is the normal foraging behavior of Komodo dragons, thanks to this source of information, we will mix up the two evidence and suggest how to proceed with our welfare assessment. Now, I see that perhaps uh, this approach may raise uh, several criticisms or a little bit of a skeptical thinking, and some of you may think, well, yeah, that's fine, but uh, would this approach allow us to obtain a welfare score for Komodo dragons? And I think we have to be honest and straightforward. The answer is no, it will not. So, and, and that is not our aim. And, and remember, I said at the beginning, uh, by and large, we need animal welfare assessments to identify problems and to monitor progress. And I think that this approach is useful to identify pro problems and see whether we are improving those problems. If we want an overall score, that is not enough. But still, it is enough to do what, to me, is the most important thing we can do, identify problems and improve the living conditions of the animals. Now, another criticism, which I think is probably more important, is uh, some of you, when I said something about natural behavior, some of you may have thought, oh yes, you are falling in the classical trap of thinking that behavior in the wild should be the gold standard for good animal welfare. And no, we are not falling in the trap, at least we are trying to avoid that trap. We are well aware, and, and this is a, a, classical, a classical paper that discussed that very, very well, we, we know that comparing behavior in the wild with behavior in zoos has many conceptual and methodological difficulties because uh, the fact that one animal is, do, is not doing something in a zoo that uh, it would do in the wild doesn't necessarily imply that the welfare of that animal is, is bad. However, what we are suggesting to do is to start with the natural behavior and that sort of filter that behavioral through the glass of basic animal welfare research. And if that basic animal welfare research allows us to identify which behavioral categories are important for the vast majority of species, we will assume that those behavioral categories, not others, will be important as well for Komodo dragons. And this is, has been done again with farm animals. Uh, we know what is the natural behavior of uh, different domestic species when they are allowed to display their behavioral repertoire. And uh, in this paper by Brack and Hopster, they basically use uh, basic uh, animal welfare research in lab animals, companion animals, some uh, farm species to disentangle what among the behavioral repertoire is important in captivity, what is not important. And this is the same sort of approach we are following with the Komodo dragon. So it is not to think that in the zoos we have to have the same behavior as in the wild, is to start with the behavior in the wild, use basic comparative animal welfare research, and decide which elements of those uh, which appear in the wild are relevant in a zoo. And then finally, Another criticism that some of you may have is, is that this approach is perhaps not aligned with current definitions of animal welfare. I know that most current definitions of animal welfare emphasize the emotional, the affective state of the animal, which to me is, is excellent and I am all for it. But I think that in some circumstances, particularly when we have very few data and when we are looking with, for a diversity of animals, we may have to look for some alternative approaches, which at the end of the day doesn't provide such a different output, but perhaps are more feasible. And to me, a very uh, useful approach is the one suggested by uh, Professor Dawkins, Marian Dawkins, 
in several papers, and more recently in her last book. And, and basically she says, animal welfare means that animals are healthy and have what they want. Uh, if you are interested uh, to know whether this is far away from other definitions of animal welfare, which is not, you can read this, uh, the, the first chapter of this book when Marion Dawkins discusses why she suggests this approach to uh, overcome some of the methodological difficulties uh, about uh, some, some other, other approaches. And the other thing is that when we organize our tool again, we follow the five domain approach by, by Mellor and, and colleagues, which is very much our current understanding of animal welfare. So I don't think the approach I suggested with the behavioral ecology and the comparative and basic animal welfare research is far away from our current understanding of animal welfare. It may be, in some respects, a little bit more pragmatic and easy to go than, than some other approaches, but at the end of the day, it will coincide, hopefully, with, with any, any of them. Okay, and this leads me to uh, my final slides, summary and take-home messages, and basically, two ideas. I think that the gap is huge, and yet we shouldn't compromise on scientific quality. What we should do is to widen up the sources of scientific information. So uh, at the end of the day, my advice would be, if we don't have uh, papers on animal welfare indicators in animal welfare journals, do not panic. Look for scientific evidence in behavioral ecology, natural history books, look for basic comparative research, and try to put that together. And of course, I am not saying at all that the end should be as soon as we can to have a list of animal-based indicators for all species. But that is gonna take a while. And even if we are very optimistic, that while is gonna be a long while. And in the meantime, we have to do something. And whatever we do, it should be based on science. So at the end, and to make a long story short, the message would be do not compromise on scientific quality, but widen up the source of your scientific information. So don't uh, restrict yourself to animal welfare journals. Don't restrict yourself to the species of interest. Simply look for alternative sources of information. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavier. Um, I've heard Xavier speak a number of times, and he also has a webinar on our website that Mavan we referenced to. So um, thank you very much. And I think perfectly demonstrates how we do need to collaborate across a wide range of fields and disciplines to achieve the tools that we need.